So um, I was asked to talk about clustering and, uh, and, its, uh, and its state and, and what the challenges are. And obviously, given how exciting the topic of clustering is, we decided to tack on visualization just to make it a little bit more pleasing. So um, I'll start. I'll start with this beautiful illustration uh, from Gary Nolan's lab of mouse hematopoiesis. And, and uh, it's just, I think, to me anyway, very pleasant to stare at. And uh, it's, it's important you know, to basically illustrate the heterogeneity effectively. And the clustering sort of comes into this. So uh, the clustering, the main aim is very simple. I'm stating the obvious uh, to group similar cells. Uh, but you know, how do we use it? What purpose essentially it's, it serves? Uh, well, one purpose is basically illustrating heterogeneity. Uh, so some of this uh, has to do with visualization. So here we already have this uh, uh, force layout graph embedding of different cells. Uh, but uh, some of the visualization methods will actually try to emphasize the clusters and will be built around maintaining cells within different clusters within certain uh, positions in the visualization space. So you can make for more effective visualization. Uh, clusters are very useful for navigating things. If I wanted to point at a certain place here, I could tell you that it's a cluster, you know, pink cluster or a cluster number something. So uh, in terms of actually navigating the space and communicating, you know, what cells we're talking about, it's a very useful unit. I think the, the critical part, though, is assigning interpretation, at least at the current state. Um, the, you know, here you see these, uh, all these subpopulations, all these clusters labeled, and, and typically when people go through these single cell data sets, the labeling is done in terms of clusters, uh, even if, if they represent sort of, in this case, parts of continuous trajectory. So uh, this is actually a site of data for the purposes of this talk, I'll focus on RNA-seq on a single, uh, single cell RNA-seq, um, because I think at least the initial iteration will have a lot of that data. So the next thing that clusters are used for, then, are more technical purposes, once we have the cluster formulated, uh, we can use, for instance, uh, the membership association of these cells to estimate some kind of a pooled signal. Uh, and that gives us a more precise uh, expression profile, let's say, or, uh, or site of profile of that subpopulation. Uh, better defined. You could use it also for uh, the, this kind of clustering for uh, further downstream analysis, like differential expression, uh, for instance, or for selecting markers for isolating these types of cells and so on. So these, uh, these kind of purposes are important to keep in mind when we're going through different clustering uh, methods. And doesn't work. Okay. So there are quite a few clustering methods. If you've seen, uh, the, you've just seen the talk about different trajectory construction methods, and these are much more exotic. So if, as you might imagine, there are 10 times more clustering methods. So I won't be able to go through all of them. I'll, I'll, I'll try to emphasize, I think, what are key distinctions between some of the classes of these approaches. Now, the important thing here is that the results of these different clustering methods will vary, uh, not only depending on the methods, but often depending on the parameters you set. Uh, to a method. It doesn't mean that you know, all of them are wrong, for instance. Uh, there's some similarity between the answers. Uh, in some cases, similarity is very strong and obvious. In other cases, uh, the similarity can be less, uh, less apparent. Uh, there is actually, uh, so Martin Hamburg actually uh, made a SC3 package that tries to build consensus clustering out of multiple methods. So how to reconcile them and, and how to choose the appropriate clustering method is, has been a bit of an, of an art. Uh, the, the, key, the important thing is that regarding, if, if the data is good, regardless of the clustering method you choose, usually there's a set of stable features or groups uh, that, that uh, show up. All right, so first, very simple things. I, I, I kind of grouped them under direct clustering methods, so let's say hierarchical clustering in this case. There are many hierarchical clustering methods. Uh, and since you're here, this is a, a, a work from J. West's group. So we have the expression profiles of different genes. Uh, genes or uh, columns, uh, cells or rows. And so there's some kind of a distance metric defined, in this case correlation metric uh, on the genes, and we simply uh, use the traditional hierarchical clustering methods to arrange the cells. And then you can cut the hierarchy at certain levels to actually determine the cluster. So simple approach, and visualization here sort of emphasizes, uh, I think, more expression patterns than cells, uh, but the cells are grouped in these clusters in a linear manner. All right, so th there are Second set of classes of sort of k-means or, or similar to k-means, very standard computer science algorithms for clustering things. Um, uh, so uh, this is an example from Alexander Adnardin's lab, where they used uh, k-means clustering on uh, 
uh, on a Euclidean distance on correlation m measure. And I'm repeating these distance measures because I'll come back to them. Um, so that allows you to basically come up with a discrete set of clusters. It's a partitioning method um, that essentially tries to, given the number of clusters, tries to uh, ideally separate the cells within the space. Uh, PAM is a similar method where you could essentially give it an arbitrary distance measure. Uh, it's worth mentioning uh, uh, some of the more specialized algorithms, so backspin from um, uh, Stan Linerson's lab, so here shown in, in a, an example of a recent publication. So this is a bi-clustering method, essentially we're trying to separate the cells, the two columns in this case, as well as the genes that define different, distinguish different cell populations of cells. Uh, it's a recursive uh, uh, div divisive method, so it tries to basically go and optimize, tries to partition the cells to optimize the correlation measure uh, within the partition, and it can go in and, and, and divide you know, multiple times a given subpopulation to generate these very, very detailed uh, cluster profiles. The separate approach is density clustering. So that typically, um, I mean, the, the idea is very simple. You, you essentially try to look for a position in space, some kind of a space, uh, where there's more cells than you would sort of expect, find peaks of this density and, and call that a cluster. Uh, very, typically, it's done in, in low-dimensional space. So in this case, uh, from, um, uh, from uh, uh, Avi Rego's lab, so this is an initial illustration or implementation, sorry, application of CIRA. Uh, so in this case, we're dealing with TSNI projection. You could project it to some other low-dimensional space. In principle, you could estimate density in high-dimensional space as well, although I haven't seen implementations like that. The, finally, uh, there's a... As, as, as Dana has mentioned, uh, there's a very um, enthusiastic community based around uh, graph-based clustering. So in this case, we represent uh, cell similarity. We put it on a graph. Uh, this is work from uh, Stan Linerson lab from 2011. And then they're looking at the ES and EF cells. And then uh, it's a k-nearest neighbor graph. In this case, uh, we connect each cell with five closest uh, neighbors based on the overall correlation profile. It's of the expression. And so what we find is that the MEF cells, uh, fibroblasts, they actually connect to each other, and then the ES cells connect to each other, and so you have this very clear partitioning in this case. Now, that, that's sort of an ideal case, right? So you might actually have some connections between ES and MEF once in a while, depending on the noise, but you should probably be able to distinguish these kind of communities uh, that connect to each other, but you know, much less so between each other. So in the graph, a theory in computer science, this is a community detection problem, again, a very well-studied problem with numerous algorithms to actually resolve it. Um, a lot of them are based on the optimization of modularity, uh, so again, connections within between uh, different groups. Uh, edge betweenness uh, is another approach, evaluating sort of the cost uh, of different edges. Uh, you could actually represent the graph, again, as a connectivity matrix and do some principal component analysis on that Laplacian matrix. And that will yield you major directions in which uh, the subpopulations can be separated. In this case, it will be, again, between ESMEF, um, uh, ESMEF cells. Uh, InfoMap is another popular method that's been used by, by a number of groups. Uh, it's also worth mentioning so the specialized, uh, more sort of specialized applications to RNA-seq. Uh, Phenograph from Dana Peer's lab and, and the newer version of CIRA is using uh, smart local moving, I think, is, is the method called. But again, uh, working on k-nearest neighbor graphs. Okay, now, uh, drilling into this a little bit more, so uh, the, all these methods, as I mentioned, they're based in some kind of a cell distance, and that's really the critical underlying metric here. So in this case, we connect the cells if their, let's say, correlation distance is close enough. And, and so depending on how you choose these distances, you can emphasize different features within the, uh, let's say, gene expression space. So I just wanted to go through some of these to emphasize how different they are. Um, you can use Euclidean distances, Euclidean distance on correlation distances, uh, L1 distance, which is simple, you know, total sum of the differences. Correlation, you've seen uh, quite clearly. Jensen Shannon, which is more uh, difference between the distributions uh, that you measure of log counts. Now, these typically work uh, a lot of them work on transformed expression values as well. So if, if you're looking at correlation, for instance, or Euclidean distance, you'd probably transform the expression values somehow, either log transformation or somehow otherwise to normalize the variance a little bit. Uh, quite often these are done on reduced dimensions. 
So first you calculate, let's say, you know, 10 p principal components, and then, there, then you use Euclidean distance to actually estimate within these components to estimate the distance between cells. Uh, some of the more advanced methods uh, using, uh, can, can sort of modify these distances by further looking at these graphs and look at the topological distances within the graphs. Um, there are newer approaches that look at multiple scales, so essentially multiple, let's say, Gaussian kernels in this case, to evaluate the similarity across, let's say, different scales within the data set and then try to somehow combine it to optimize the cluster definitions. Um, it's worth noting that some of these distances can be modified, let's say, by weighting uh, certain errors or, or measurements that you expect to be errors. Uh, the other feature that's very prominent to these applications is that uh, gene sets are often restricted, you know, whether you call it feature selection or, or focusing on a particular aspect of the transcriptome, it's often the case. Okay, um, so there are also a set of model-based distances, so uh, here from Iremit's lab, so uh, let's say based on the Poisson measurement, and I'll talk about this a little bit. So the, the key thing here is, you know, given this list of distances and options, it's actually, I think, unclear what the, you know, which one of them gets the closer to biological significance and which part uh, of, of, of biology might emphasize. So first challenge is so basically how to actually interpret these distances. Uh, one option is to say that the distance is a sort of deviation from equality. So are these two cells the same or not? Right? If they're not the same, they're further apart. Uh, you can think of it as a statistical test, let's say, based on the Poisson distribution or something like that. Uh, well, there are a couple of issues with this. So uh, the, that statistical power will vary with the coverage of a cell, essentially, no matter how you cut it. So cells that are, that are very well measured will appear to be more significantly further apart than the ones that are poorly measured. Also, these models, uh, we have to think about what are they trying to capture. Are they trying to capture the, the error of the measurement itself, our model, let's say, of Poisson sampling of the molecules, or are they trying to capture the variability that we expect from the biology? Right? So let's say a Poisson measurement for a highly expressed gene, a Poisson model, if the gene varies by you know, just uh, one third, for instance, or even 10% of its expression level, it will be a hugely significant signal just because we have many of these molecules, but in terms of biology, it might actually not matter that much. Uh, so the other option is to look, think of it as a sort of amount of transcriptional change that the cell needs to go through uh, to, to get from one point to another in this space, uh, kind of like L1 distance, for instance. But uh, obviously, again, not all genes are equal. A change in the transcription factor can be very small in terms of numbers of molecules compared to an effector gene, and yet the biological outcome is quite different. Um, it's also important to think, be aware at least, of the potential dangers of low dimensional representations. Uh, if we're doing, if not careful about doing, let's say, principal components, one of the components could represent essentially a single gene or, or you know, a single highly expressed gene. And then the clustering would be very stable, but probably uh, not reflected of the oral complexity of the populations. Uh, finally, you could think of it as a likelihood of transcriptional change, you know, of going from one place to another, and that sort of would incorporate more of our understanding of biological variation, how likely the cell end up in one place or another. All right, so the other question is, is it a real cluster? So how, how far should we uh, be separating the cells into different clusters? Should we separate this one, for instance? And that sort of uh, has to do with granularity of the clustering. Hierarchical clustering tends to be a little more stable because you could see the relationship between the cluster that was just split or not split in the other analysis. But the question is how to basically evaluate this type of stability. Uh, you could think about likelihood of basically observing that cluster in a theoretical and an actual repeat experiment. You could look at the stability of that cluster across the replicates. You could actually try to evaluate this computationally. That's what some of the methods like Surat does uh, with, let's say, cell sub subsampling uh, or introduce your models of measurement noise and see if the cluster is actually stable under that measurement noise. Um, finally, they, there's also, you, you could think of a robustness of the gene expression signature. If it happens that the cluster is essentially driven by a single gene, perhaps that's not the kind of feature that you want. Uh, finally, the, the, the actual thing we would like to know is if there's a phenotype associated with a cluster. That's probably a much better definition, but again, very hard to assess given the mapping. Uh, the other thing I wanted to emphasize is that uh, the cluster definition, especially the partition-based clusters, give you some kind of a hierarchy or some kind of configuration of partitioning of the cells, and they may not be unique. So a quick example here from, uh, uh, so columns of cells here, and these are neurons that are maturing, this uh, main feature separating cells shows increasing maturation. And just look at the last line, so these are, uh, 
these, this feature marks these uh, DLX genes, essentially showing interneurons. So if you, if you run clustering, any clustering on this, you will see neuronal maturation, which is a true biological feature. But you could alternatively classify them as interneurons versus uh, excitatory neurons, right? That's a perfectly valid classification. So how does that work? In principle, you know, as we have more and more cells, um, the clustering typically would segment by some subset of properties that, that is able to learn from RNA-seq. And in the limit, if we get more and more cells, it would be sort of a combination of all properties. But perhaps, you know, not all of these properties you actually want to see. More importantly, you'd like to have a visualization technique that shows you alternative ways of essentially classifying the cells. And just very quick example here with cell cycle, you know, we have some kind of a population, we define the clusters, and if you look at the cell cycle signature, you see that basically that separation is a cell cycle separation. And actually, this separation is also cell cycle separation. So we would like to have a visualization technique that actually allows you to capture the fact that these two uh, groups are tied by a similar process, in this case, a state change of a cell. And then, of course, um, yeah, cell type, cell state. Uh, I, I think of it as a lighthearted kind of beer conversation at this point, as opposed to sort of the, the war of 16th and 17th century between biologists. And uh, uh, there's, a, you know, there's a particular definition that, that I tried to uh, come up with that has to do with reversibility of the, of the uh, transcriptional change under physiological conditions. So as long as the cell can go back and forth, and we can think of it as a state as opposed to a type. But I should just point out that none of this is universal. You know, there will be a lot of exceptions um, that, that are very important for the biology. So ideally, you'd like to, as, as Amos pointed out, try to sort of predict the potential futures of the cell and classify it based on that. But I think we're quite far from that. So for now, maybe we can agree on more uh, terminology and guidelines rather than strict definitions. Thank you. Thank you.